So my initial plan was to start today by going over the uh, exam, but um, given that the grade range was from 95 to 99, I don't think that's really necessary. Uh, Y'all did fine. But um, one thing I would like to ask before we move on, right? Um, <clears throat> is there anything that you think we could have done in class to help you feel better prepared for the exam? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's like none of you seem to have that much trouble with it, so you, you, I mean, clearly you all showed up. You know, you showed up ready to play, right? Um, but uh, was there anything that we did in class that you did think particularly helped you prepare for the exam? Is there anything we've been doing that you think has helped reinforce the information or? Going this? over the vocabulary quizzes the Monday after they're due. Okay, yeah, yeah, because I, I know that that's not exciting or interesting, but it is helpful, right? I think it just reinforces what text an author to associate words with. Okay. I think that helped me a lot. Okay. And I think it helps, like, how, how do I explain it? Like, how, like, one story will have, like, like some kind of theme or something, and, uh -huh. like, we keep kind of, like, reiterating it like throughout like different works too so okay. we kind of like really have like a good understanding of it. Like okay. connecting the theme throughout multiple works I think that helps. Yeah. Like okay. how we like focus on like Debbie and like Dorian very like kind of like kept like coming up and we like go back to it and so it helped me like really uh -huh. understand like what I meant. Okay. So when we're coming back to the same kinds of ideas again and again that's helping. Okay. Repetition. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's I mean that that's <laughs> Drill it and kill it, right? <laughs> okay, anything else do you think has been particularly helpful or unhelpful? Basically just so that I know what to continue doing forward and you know what sorts of things I might want, want to think about doing. I'm on board with what we've been doing. Okay. All right. I'm fully on board with that. All right. So stay the course. All right. All right. So um, for next remember for tonight. Paper one is due, um, and for next time, you're reading The Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield, right? You're just going to read one short story for next time, rather than, you know, three or four. So, I, I get it, you know, it's we're, we're just after midterm, and we tend to slump a little bit um, at the midterm point. So, you know, a smaller reading assignment seems <clears throat> like a good idea. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about today before we got into uh, the Yates poems, um, I passed out for you here the uh, assignment sheet for the presentation. Everybody got one, right? Okay. So I know it says here you and your partners, this used to be a group presentation assignment, but there aren't enough people to form groups in this class. So they're going to be solo presentations. Um, you're going to give a 20 minute presentation on your assigned topic. You have to use at least five secondary sources. Uh, for each of these, I've recommended three. Right, and then you can find two on your own. And provide a complete bibliography for the project. So um, <clears throat> each of you has your assignment here. Uh, is anybody particularly irritated or annoyed by what I've assigned? Everybody's okay with what you got? I don't care for Elliot, but... It's okay, you're not doing Elliot. You're, Wait, doing, you're, you're doing George Orwell. Okay, I mixed up authors. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you're, 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 yeah, you're presenting on Orwell, so yeah, don't, don't worry about Elliot. I'm pleased with Okay, good. Um, and so what I'm gonna wanna do with each of you, uh, like, you know, because I want to set you up for success here. Um, a week out from your presentation, I'm going to want to meet with you and see what you've got and, you know, what questions you have and where you're having difficulties and, you know, try to, you know, work through it with you to make sure that, um, make sure the presentation is the best it can be. And look, look like, you know, I, I've set here as a limit here 20 minutes, right? So think of 20 minutes as a minimum. 
I know that some of y'all have given you presentation time in class and you've just taken it and run with it. <laughs> so that's okay too, right? It's better to have more material than you think you need. And honestly, like if you're doing well, I'm not gonna stop you. So you know, feel free to keep talking for as long as you have material. All right, any questions about this so far? So, okay, so I'm just reiterating. So, uh -huh. so we have, yeah. okay, so like I'm WH Auden, and then my topic is like political commitment, and then I give a presentation for 20 minutes about like political commitment from like based on the audience. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so what, what, yeah, what you're going to want to do is focus on like how, like, how on the uh, specific Auden poems and essay that you're reading for that day, like how they treat the idea of political. And these sources will all help you with that. Any other? Yeah, Bree. I'm assuming I'm writing about shell shock and post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. As a result of war. Yeah, so what, what, what I want you to focus on specifically in Mrs. Dalloway is the character Septimus Smith, right? Mm -hmm. So try to get, give, us, give us a good reading of Septimus and uh, how that relates to um, post-World War I anxiety. Okay, well, there you go. All right. <laughs> Can I use those sources? Um, run it by me first. Oh. I just have one really good one. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Have any of you never done a presentation like this before? Sam, you have not? Okay. <laughs> I think I've done 20 minutes. Okay, you've never had to talk for that long. And I've had some that I've had talked for like 10 minutes, and I talked like super fast. Like, okay, I'm okay. And, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and that's actually one of the reasons why you need to have more material than you think you need, right? Because once you get up here, you're going to start talking fast. Um, and you might end up giving the presentation in half the time you thought it was going to take. So it's good to make sure you have enough material, and like, it's good to practice couple of times before you actually have to give it to, you know, build your confidence, right? Practice slowing down in particular, you know, practice speaking in slow measured tones. That way when you actually get up to give this, you still might speed up a little bit, but not quite so much as you would have if you were doing it cold, right? Uh, the other thing I want to note here is about um, things like visual aids, right? Um, so, how many of you like sit, sitting in a class where there's a lot of language put on PowerPoint slides that you just are expected to copy down, and the room is dark, and the professor just reads off the slides? It depends on what class. <laughs> it depends on the class. Okay, fair enough. But oftentimes that particular style of presentation is not all that engaging. There's like minimal bullet points, and then you discuss the bullet point. But you have like okay. one like short sentence or bullet point, and then you go into discussion. Yeah, so if you're going to use PowerPoint or Prezi or Google Slides or whatever, then use that kind of thing as a model, right? Use it to show pictures and to put up bullet points. Um, if you want to have note cards, that's fine, right? But in general, like, like what you should try to aim for is to know your material so well that you don't need a lot of specific notes, right? That you know you can maybe have what, like you know, well, you know, usually what I have here, right, is like a couple of bullets I want to hit in the class period. And sometimes I don't get to all this stuff because you don't ask questions about it, or it just doesn't become doesn't end up being relevant. But you know, um, when you know the material well then you can, <clears throat> then some, the over-preparing might actually trip you up. Um, other things uh, to keep in mind here. So I've got the, the grading standards here. Right? So this is worth 15 points total, right? So I'm going to give you five points for how well you seem to understand the material. I'm going to give you five points for the quality of your supporting materials, whether that's a PowerPoint presentation 
or um, posters or a handout or whatever, right? Basically anything that you show or give to the class. And you'll get five points for the quality of your research, right? So in terms of the research, I want you to treat this like you would an end of semester research paper, right? Use the three sources I gave you. Um, you can get most of them. If you can't get them directly from our library, you can get them through the consortium. Um, some of them I might actually even be able to loan to you. I have copies of them, so if you just come and talk to me, um, I might be able to <coughs> help you out with some of this stuff. Um, and yeah, now that you have the assignment, start on the research more or less immediately, right? Get your sources in order first. since you've got the time to do it, right? Because then if you have to order something from this consortium and it doesn't come in time, right, you know, you're not scrambling at the end. Okay, anybody have any other questions about this? Not currently. All right, if questions do arise, please do feel free to get in touch. I have every bit of confidence in all of you that this is gonna go swimming. Okay. Um, right, so <clears throat> let's get back to our good friend, uh, Mr. William Butler Yates. Uh, so how did this go for you? What did you think? Questions. Okay. I expected that you would have questions. Go I ahead Go ahead and ask your questions. Yes? <laughs> I've read the last two before. I've read the last two before. The last two poems? Yeah, the Easter one and the... Uh, second, second coming. Okay, well, well, did you read them in like a Britlet 2 class or? Uh, yeah, school. And a Britlet 2 oh, class. Oh, high school and a Britlet 2. Okay. I read the second coming. I can't remember. It was here. I don't remember what class. Uh -huh. I like broke it down and everything. But. Yeah, you, 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 uh, you've mentioned it. You've mentioned it you know, yeah, before that you've done that. Who, who did you do it with? Whose class was it? Uh, don't remember? <laughs> no, I have no idea. But I know I know who did it. Okay. All right. So, um, so some of this stuff is not completely unfamiliar to some of you, that's good. Um, so what questions do y'all have about this? I think I'm wrong with what's going on in Easter. Okay. Well, let's start with what you think is going on in Easter. It's obviously referencing um, uh, some type of revolution or rebellion uh -huh. yes. that failed. Yes. And he talks about dreams and hopeless attempts at achieving dreams and how they were changed by it and what came out of it or what they ended up with was uh -huh. terribly beautiful. Okay. And yeah, this poem and the second coming are kind of related to each other, right? So it probably helps if we think about these as companion pieces to one another uh, because he's thinking along the same lines. Okay, so Easter 1916 is, yes, specifically about a failed revolution. So, <clears throat> the event in Irish history that is known as the Easter Rising, uh, the Irish tend to use the word rising to refer to revolutions. Um, occurred from January 24th to 29th, or not, eight, from April 24th to 29th in 1916. So what happened was um, a group of high-ranking members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood decided to take advantage of the British Army's distraction in continental Europe at the time, right? So this is the middle of the First World War. To proclaim an Irish Republic and to take over a number of strategic sites within Dublin specifically, right? So, you know, there, there were risings in other parts of the country as well, but there were, the main action was in Dublin. Um, and they proclaimed their republic 
from the general post office in what was then Sackville Street, what's now called O'Connell Street. And then um, the British Army came in and started shelling um, all of the positions that the IRB had taken over. Uh, the leaders were rounded up and captured. And the majority of them were executed, with a couple of exceptions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, now, when this rising was happening, most Dublin residents regarded this as ridiculous and as a serious inconvenience. Right, here are these idiots running around in their funny uniforms, waving guns in the air, yelling revolution, inviting the soldiers into town to just come and take them out and clog up the streets and make it so no one can go out. What a bunch of assholes. However, the harsh treatment dealt out by the British government to the leaders of the revolt changes public sympathy. Right, so the leaders of the rising were Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, both of whom were poets and scholars. Uh, McDonough taught at University College Dublin. Patrick Pierce ran an Irish language school. Uh, Eamon Kent. whose birth name was Edmund Kent. But a lot of these guys um, Irishized or Gaelicized their names when they joined the Gaelic League. Constance Markiewicz, James Connolly, John McBride, and Thomas Clark. And right as we know from having read Joyce, Dublin in the early 20th century was a pretty small place. People knew each other, right? And Yeats was personally acquainted with several of the leaders of the revolt. Right? In particular, he had known Constance Markiewicz when she was a young Anglo-Irish heiress before she married a Polish count and got herself involved in revolutionary politics. Um, he knew Thomas McDonough and Patrick Pierce, you know, fellow poets. Um, he knew James Connolly and didn't take him all that seriously. Connolly was the, um, the founder of the Irish Labor Party. Um, and was a prominent uh, socialist leader um, in early 20th century Ireland. Uh, McBride, uh, he knew and despised. McBride was married to a woman named Maud Gunn. Now, those of you who have encountered Gates before, did you talk at all about Maud Gunn and who she was? Yes. Okay, yeah, who's Maud Gunn? Wasn't it his... Am I wrong? I don't know. I've heard the name. Okay, so Maud Gunn was the great unrequited love of Yeats' life. Okay, so yeah, I said, yeah. Yeah, it was this woman that he was obsessed with uh, from his kind of late teen years, right? Into middle age. And he kind of consistently pursued her and was consistently rebuffed to the point where like, once she had kind of turned him down for the final time, he started to turn his attentions to her adult daughter. I know, yeah, I <laughs> believe it's, yes, yes, it's creepy. Okay. But Gunn had married uh, a guy named John McBride, um, who was um, known for fighting as a volunteer at various um, anti-British colonial causes um, <clears throat> across the empire, uh, particularly in South Africa. 
Um, and McBride um, was apparently a, a drunk and was physically abusive to Gunn and her daughter. And so she obtained a legal separation. At the time of the, rev the rising, McBride and Gunn were, separ were legally separated. But, uh, so yeah, so he knows many of these people personally, right? And <clears throat> with one exception, all of these leaders are executed. I'm going to throw one more name up here. He wasn't a leader of the revolution, but he was. Um, he becomes important in later Irish history, and uh, he, uh, he also narrowly avoids execution. Um, we've got to do with Eamon de Valera. So we know that, because I just told you, the de Valera avoids execution. Can you guess which of these other individuals avoided being executed? Pardon? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It would be ironic if it was McBride. Oh, McBride was very much executed. Was it Constance? Yes. Constance Markiewicz was not executed because she was a woman. And Eamon de Valera was not executed because he was born in New York City and thus was an American citizen. So because the British wanted to enlist American aid in the First World War, then yeah, the Americans hadn't joined the war effort yet. Um, yeah, they didn't want to, yeah, they didn't want to piss them off by executing an American citizen. Yeah, but Connolly in particular um, generated a great deal of sympathy uh, from the public when he was executed. So Connolly had been badly injured in the fighting. Um, his arm was broken, uh, badly, was badly infected, and he was so feverish at the time of his execution by firing squad that he couldn't stand up. They had to tie him to a chair. Yeah. And the Irish nationalists used this, right? This, you know, the particular cruelty of this execution um, in order to demonstrate <coughs> British perfidy, right? So the basic background to this, to all of this happening, right, is that in 1913, remember when we talked about home rule? Does anybody remember what home rule was? Okay, yeah, this idea that you know, Ireland could have its, it would still be part of the United Kingdom, but it would have its own devolved parliament, right? Kind of like Scotland and Wales have today, and Northern Ireland has as well. So, in 1913, a Home Rule Bill passed. And then what happens in 1914? Anybody know? Great Yep. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated in Sarajevo, the First World War breaks out, and so that home rule bill is suspended. And <clears throat> this kind of um, takes the wind out of the sails of that more moderate Irish nationalism that was sort of more just kind of pushing for representation and political rights and gives more, um, it gives more influence to these physical force nationalists who simply want to break away and form an Irish Republic, right? So, you know, the, par the Parnellite, anti-Parnellite dispute is kind of rendered moot here. Um, it's like, well, we're not getting home rule anyway, so we may as well push for um, a break altogether here. But let's look at the way Yeats actually treats this incident in the poem and see if, you know, now that we know a little bit more about this, this makes any more sense to us, right? Can I get somebody to read the first verse paragraph for us on um, page 73? <clears throat> I've met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces, 
from counter or desk among gray, 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head, or polite, meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite, meaningless words. And I thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jib, 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 yeah, to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. All terrible beauty is born. Thank you. So first question I want to ask you here. Does this sound anything like the Yates that we met a couple weeks ago. Nope. Yeah, this is a com like almost a completely different poet here, right? So, what kinds of things do we see stripped out? The mythology, the more fanciful, like fantasy part of it. Okay, yeah, the mythology and the fantasy. Are largely gone here, right? Do we notice any things? Do we notice any differences in the style here? Okay. Well, what what makes it sound more formal to you, Bree? Uh, it just seems like he's tiptoeing around, saying that he really didn't care about talking to these people, like polite, meaningless words. Uh -huh. He's trying to politely say that none of the conversations he had with these people had any real meaning or substance. Yeah, so he is again indicating familiarity with these people. Yeah, I knew them, right? I would pass them on the street, we'd say hello. But what seems to have been his general opinion of them? They're clowns. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. They're a bunch of clowns, right? Is, is Motley, I've heard that word before, is it a fabric or something? That, it's like, something that, word that is like, for. Yeah. Like the, like the little, like, no, Motley is like, actually, it's, yeah, it's like the multicolored costume oh, okay, okay. that, uh, that, that a, a, a king's fool or a jester okay. would wear. I, just put, I was like, it was like in my head, I'm like, what is that? But yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the image here, yeah, is meant to conjure up, yeah, the idea that these people are a bunch of fucking clowns, right? That Yates didn't take them seriously, and neither did anybody else. Right? All change changed utterly terrible beauty is born, right? And this idea of terrible beauty repeats throughout the poem, right? What do you think this means? What do you think the terrible beauty is that has been born? Referencing the death and the execution, particularly of Connolly, and then what happened afterwards? The beauty of like people coming together with it. Yeah, how how do their how do their executions transform them? They became martyrs. Okay, yeah. Li on a literal level here, yeah, they 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 become martyrs to a cause, right? I think let's um, let's keep going here, and we'll see kind of like to what extent Yeats seems to regard this martyrdom as a positive thing, right? Can I get somebody to continue reading uh, from the next verse paragraph? Starting with that woman's days were spent. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nice and argument until her voice were shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to Harriet's? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his horse. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vain, glorious lout. He had done most good or wrong to some who were near my heart. Yet I number him in the song, he too has resigned his part. In the casual comedy, he too has been changed in his turn, Transformed utterly a terrible beauty form. Okay, thanks. So, <clears throat> what what's going on here? What's happening in this first paragraph? He's listing everybody that was involved in leadership, even the man that he utterly hated. Yeah, he's 
these, yeah, it's like, like these are the people in my neighborhood, right? <laughs> these are the people who were involved in this that I knew. All right, he knew Constance Markiewicz. She's the first one he talked Yeah, and what's his opinion of her seem to be here? That she was naive and young. Okay, ignorant, good, her days spent in ignorant goodwill, right? So she means well, but <laughs> yeah, her nights, you know, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill, right? What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to Harriers? So he's remembering here the Constance Markiewicz that he'd known as a girl, right? And comparing it uh, with the adult Constance Markiewicz. And which picture does he seem to find more attractive? Yeah, the young fox hunting lady, right? He finds more attractive than the adult rhetorician. <clears throat> Going to meetings and wearing army uniforms and shouting at people, right? So the initial change that had come over her, he seems to regard as a negative one, right? You know, ignorant, shrill. And then these next two figures, are Patrick Pierce and Thomas McDonough. And then, yeah, the other man that he had dreamed a drunken, vainglorious lout is John McBride. Right. Yet I number him in the song. He, too, has resigned his part in the casual comedy. So taking this back to what Nick said about the first stanza, right, about the Yates' basic opinion of these people is that they were a bunch of clowns. What does it mean here that they've resigned their part in the casual comedy? Or both of them died. Yeah, three out, of four, three out of four of them died, right? And at the time that Yeats wrote this poem, Constance Markiewicz was also under sentence of death, though that, that sentence was commuted. They've given up their lives. Yeah. Even though she wasn't executed, Constance never really had a life after that. Her social standing, everything was stripped away from her. Because no one wanted to be associated with her because they would be guilty by association if something else ever happened. Actually, she gets elected to Parliament while she's in prison. <laughs> we will love that. Okay, just we have a little side note here, right? So you remember we remember how Parnell led the Irish Parliamentary Party. And the Irish Parliamentary Party was mostly you know, like fairly genteel, or, you know, a bunch of you know, gentlemen who went and did their part and served in Parliament. You know, they held the balance of power between the liberals and conservatives and all that, and what have you. So as the Irish Parliamentary Party disappears, it's replaced by a party called Sinn Féin that's founded in 1905 by a journalist named Arthur Griffith. And Sinn Féin in Irish, it doesn't translate, like it doesn't translate directly in English, and I think that's one of the reasons they chose the name. But the closest translation is we ourselves. And Sinn Féin was a more kind of hardcore nationalist party. And while the IPP guys, like I said, would go and serve their terms in Parliament, um, Sinn Féin, as a protest, would get themselves elected and then refuse to be seated. So they refused to participate in the system, and they were kind of trying to gum up the works, right? But yeah, um, Constance Markiewicz, while she's in prison, gets elected uh, to Parliament as a Sinn Féin candidate. There was no law that said that she couldn't um, run. <laughs> For uh, run uh, for an MP's office while you were in prison. That's beautiful. <laughs> she also she also is the first woman elected to a seat in the British Parliament, even though she did not take that seat. Love that. Right, but yeah. So that's ju just a little historical side note here, right? But yeah, but let's. Uh, like, well, I think what I'm trying to think through here is this connection between motley and comedy in these first two verse paragraphs, right? 
So the motley is part of the indication that he thinks these people are clowns, right? And if they've now resigned their part in the casual comedy. Would it, I have an idea. But yeah, go ahead. Would it, he said they're like resigned to play their part. So they kind of accepted like, okay, well, we're fixed to get killed. Like, but they've accepted that as their fate. Like they know like, this is what we've mm -hmm. done to do this. We just have to accept it and hope that in the future it can be done again and actually like, do its job. Okay, the problem there is it doesn't say that they're resigned to their parts. Okay. It says they resign, he said resign his part, right? So to resign in this case means like, you know, to quit, to leave, to abdicate, right? Considering that he said while he was writing this, that Constance was still under a death sentence, uh -huh. I kind of want to stick with they resign their part in the quality that is life. Yeah. <laughs> they gave up their lives. Uh-huh. And it seems, yeah, the casual comedy here seems to be like middle class Dublin life where Motley is worn, right? You know, he implicates himself in all of that as well, because, you know, he's, he's talking about how he's, you know, he meets with these people and then thinks of a joke to tell his friend at the club about them later on, right? Okay. Was that a hand up neck or just, uh, <laughs> just acknowledging? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think yeah, this casual comedy is like yeah, like day to day Dublin. Yeah, I think we're we're I think we're we're kind of getting this um, <clears throat> into shape here now. Now can I get somebody to read the next uh, verse paragraph here? Start with hearts with one purpose alone. Hearts with one purpose alone, through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse uh, flashes within it where long leg more hens die and hens to more cocks call. Minute by minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. Okay, so this verse paragraph is organized around a specific binary opposition, right? Can y'all figure out what it is here? Like what two things are opposed to each other in this verse paragraph? Okay, why would you say life and death, Brie? Because you have, in the second line of it, it says summer and winter. Winter is usually considered a time of death because things are okay. back. Mm -hmm. Summer, things are alive again. Enchanted to a stone. The stone is hard and cold, not really alive. And then the okay. back that, it's a living stream. Uh-huh. But it's flowing. A stone isn't really dead either, though, right? It's just not alive. So I think, I think you're thinking along the right track here, right? But stick with that stone image and think about what it represents and think about what it's doing here. How is the stone different from other things? It's hard and steadfast. It doesn't come and go. Yeah, it's hard. It's steadfast. Yeah, it doesn't come and go. It doesn't... Change? Yeah. Everything else in this verse paragraph is moving and shifting and changing, right? You know, whether we're talking about the stream or the seasons or the clouds, right? The animals, what have you, right? But the stone in the middle of the stream is unchanging, it's still. And what is the stillness of that stone do? to all of these changing things around it. It's like a pause. Okay, how I have to stop to go around it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream, right? So this stone is this great big still thing that all of these other moving, changing things have to adjust themselves to and work their way around, right? So this stone, even though it is itself just kind of sitting there doing nothing, is a disturbance and an impediment. And what does the stone represent? What do you think the stone represents here? England. Why would you say England? Because England's always in the way of Ireland. <laughs> the same can be argued the other way, that Ireland is in the way of England. <laughs> they seem to be a huge pain in their neck. Yeah, okay, also, also true. Both right? ways. Yes. Um, I think it might help if we think about what the stone comes from here. Like what turns into the stone? Hearts with one purpose alone, right? Their deaths become the stone. Well, is it their deaths specifically that become the stone? Hearts with one purpose alone. What does that mean if you've got a hearts with one purpose alone? It's yeah. Is it like their ideas? Because like all their hearts are in like one idea, and that idea yeah. is like unchanging? Yeah, it's their devotion to that fixed cause, right? Yeah, good. Their devotion to this cause is, on the one hand, like the still center of a moving world, right? But it's also a thing that is throwing that moving world out of balance. So, do we get the sense yet about whether Yeats regards this rising as a wholly positive thing? Does he seem to be all in on this? He's not all in. I don't think he's all in. I think he could see the I think he could see the future of what like this will be. Uh -huh. Because obviously uh, I already is gonna be created soon enough and then they're gonna <laughs> blow up a boat and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. So right. I feel like he can I feel like he's for it. Like he's like, yeah, it, the independence is necessary, but also like I think he can see like the violet sense that I happen now because of this. Yeah, there's a deep ambivalence here, right? This whole idea of terrible beauty, right? I think, yeah, the, the, this expresses his ambivalence about what these people have done and what their transformation from a bunch of, a bunch of clowns into heroes is going to cause socially, politically, economically, whatever. It's going to upset everything, right? So let's look, uh, let's try to wrap this one up. Let's look at the last verse paragraph here. Can I get uh, somebody to read that first, please? <clears throat> Starting with too long a sacrifice. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, then may it suffice. That is heaven's part. Our time, or our part to murmur name upon name, as a mother names her child, when sleep at last has come, on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said, we know their dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if ex excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now, in, now and in time to be, wherever green is warm, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Thank you. So let's 
trying to think about here to what extent Yates is able to resolve this terrible beauty problem here. What's going on in this last verse paragraph? First of all, what do we start with here? Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. What does that mean? What do you think that means? When you've been wanting something, working for something for so long, and you keep hitting that block, it can make you cold. Okay, yeah. When you've been giving of yourself, yeah, to a particular cause for too long and seeing no result from it, right? Yeah, it can harden the heart, right? You know, may, you know enchant the heart to a stone, right? Okay, good. A when may it suffice that is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that have run wild. What's going on there? Well, let me put it this way: like, what, what's, the, where, where do we hear the notes of doubt creeping in in this last verse paragraph? Was it needless death after all, right? Now, what would make these deaths needless? If nothing came out of it. Okay, if nothing came out of it, right? What else if that he mentions the next line might make it needless? If England reinstates the bill, that was suspended. Yeah, the Home Rule bill isn't dead, it's just suspended, right? So, if the English resurrect the bill and implement it, then what was the point of all this, right? So what's changed by their sacrifice is not just Yeats' image of them as a bunch of you know, basically Miss Iverses, right? They've changed the whole political situation here, right? After this revolution, what's the likelihood that that Home Rule Bill is going to be reinstated? Basically nil, yeah. So by taking their chance and proclaiming an independent republic, they've basically killed the possibility of this more measured moderate response, right? So <clears throat> the terrible beauty that's coming out of this might also be the struggle for an independent Irish Republic, right? And you know, the beautiful dream accompanied by that kind of attendant loss of life. I think it might help to, to, to remember um, when we talked about that figure of Kathleen McCoolahan and the Ashling a couple of weeks ago. Does anybody remember what an Ashling was, what an Ashling poem was? It's a kind of dream vision poem. It was popular in 18th century Ireland. representing Ireland keeps herself young and beautiful by draining the young male poet of his energy and his essence, right? So I think that there's something of that maybe captured in the whole terrible beauty um, idea as well. But I'm also willing to acknowledge that I might be stretching that a little bit. Okay, so does this poem make a little bit more sense to you now? Much more sense. Okay. If 
feel good. We feel good about this one. We feel okay about this one. Context was needed. Okay, and yeah, I mean, th this is a poem because it represents because it, it's you know a representation of a specific historical event that we don't really talk about that much in the United States. Yeah, I get that this required a, a good bit of contextual. But yeah, I think it's also a good example of the differences in Yeats' style and concerns and his own relationship to Irishness, which becomes much more ambivalent as he gets older. So what other, uh, what other uh, poems do you have questions about here? Were there other poems that you found uh, confusing or difficult? Okay. I grabbed up letters instead of these. <laughs> it happens. I don't know what counts for that. I just like grab. <laughs> I had to read a code. Uh, I had to read a code twice to understand okay. what it was meaning. The second time around, I got like a full understanding. Okay, cool. So close to full. Anyway. Let's let's go to page fifty-two. Then let's go to a code. So, can you read it for us, then? Right. <clears throat> I made my song a code covered with embroideries out of old mythologies, from heel to throat. But the fools caught it, wore it in the world's eye, as though they'd wrought it. Some let them take it, for there's, for there's more enterprise in walking naked. Okay, cool. So what, what did you find confusing about this poem when you first read it? When I first read it, I'm just I'm just trying to understand like what what does the code have to do with mythology? Or what, <laughs> what does that have to do with somebody writing something? And but the second time around, I'm reading it, it's like oh that makes so much more sense. A code embroidery is mythology being taken by others who wrote it, and uh -huh. then I, I love how it just seems like this is his transitional point. Like he's going to go beyond the mythologies. It's it's better to be original. Yeah, this is exactly why I wanted you to read this poem for today and why I wanted you to read it first. Um, because this is a transitional poem in Yeats's career, right? So the, the volume this is taken from is called Responsibilities, right? The ones before this are, um, you know, they're called things like the Green Helmet and, uh, you know, the... Um, you know, in, in you know, in the seven woods and uh, the wind among the reeds, and they have these kind of very fanciful kinds of names, right? But this volume is called Responsibilities, and there is a big change in Yeats's career that occurs around this time, right? So, in 1913. Yeats begins seasonally sharing a cabin in study, sharing a, 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 cab, a cottage in Sussex with a young American poet by the name of Ezra Pound. Are you familiar with Pound? Have any of you read Pound in other classes? I've like heard of Ezra Pound like millions of times. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if I've ever read. Maybe like popular. Yeah, his, his, repu his reputation these days is under kind of a cloud because fascist collaborator. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest, never heard of him. <laughs> yeah, he, he did a pro Mussolini radio broadcast from Italy during the Second World War. Um, yeah, um, so, uh, so not a great guy. But yeah, he's still, in 1913, um, 20 years away from that. Right? He's a young poet, right? American, very confident, and an admirer of Yeats, who wants to come and meet and work with um, the, <clears throat> the great poet. Right? Yeats has already kind of established himself by this time as the leading English language poet. So, They rent this cottage in Sussex, it's called Stone Cottage, um, and they spend <clears throat> their, you know, they spend uh, you know, whole days um, just, you know, writing poetry, reading, composing poetry, reading each other's poetry, and then um, going down to the pub in the, at the end of the day for hard cider. 
and then coming back and writing more poetry. Um, and Pound's, like, even though Pound is 20 years younger than Yeats at this point, he actually does have a profound influence on Yeats's style. So Pound was associated in the early part of his career with a movement called Imagism. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you have probably not heard of Imagism. This is not familiar. OK. So Imagism is another one of those short-lived, manifesto-driven modernist movements. Right around the same period as Surrealism and Dada and Futurism. So it lasts from about 1909 to about 1917, a little under a decade. And Pound, like to give, to give you a sense of what his poetic principles were at the time, in 1913, in a magazine called Poetry, he publishes an article called A Few Don'ts by an Imagist. It's typical of Pound to um, kind of uh, combine kind of colloquial, laconic Americanisms uh, with um, <clears throat> kind of pretentious, pretentious French pronunciations. So he elucidates in this article three basic principles of images. Right? The first, direct treatment of the thing whether subjective or objective. And we're going to see probably the next time we look at Yeats, the Yeats actually is, ends up borrowing some of this language directly from Pound's ideas. Right. Second, to use absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. And finally, as regarding rhythm, to compose in sequence of the musical phrase not in sequence of the metronome So let's see if we can unpack some of this in the time we have left um, to apply it to Yeats's uh, new style, right? So direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective, what do you think that means? To talk directly about something and not talk around it too much? Yeah, to make sure that you are yet directly and clearly presenting the thing that you are actually describing like the image. What's that? Like you did in Easter. Yeah. To use absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. What do you think? Uh, what do you think he's reacting to or trying to get rid of there? The mythology, the wordiness. Yeah. That. What he's trying to get rid of there is that kind of poetic diction, right? I um, yeah, pardon? The candy coating of things. Well, not so much the candy coating of things here as like the tendency poets to have like to use extra words to get enough yeah, syllables see. for the line, right? So like if you're writing a sonnet, that's a very tightly defined form, right? You need 14 lines and you need 10 syllables in every line. So sometimes if you can't quite get a thought out, 
um, in you know more than six syllables, you know you might add a couple of little rhetorical flourishes, right? So this is the kind of thing that Pound is trying to get rid of, and this is actually one of the reasons why you probably see that you know you may have noticed that you know the lines in Yeats's poems are often a little bit shorter in this kind of middle style than they were in the older, more Victorian influenced style, right? They're, he's not writing the same kind of long, slow lines the decadents tended to like. And this last piece here, as regarding rhythm, to compose in sequence of the musical phrase, not in sequence of the metronome. You know what that's referring to? One's more natural, the other's more mechanical. Okay, yeah, one's more natural, one's more mechanical, right? And you all know what the conventional way or the traditional way of counting meter is? In, in poetry. Huh. Do you know what? I say it's an I am, but. Okay, yeah, it's okay. We're thinking along the same, we're thinking along the right lines there, right? So things like I ams and trochees and anapests and dactyls and spondees, right? These things that we call feet. Right? And feet have a set number of stresses and a set number of syllables, right? So an iamb is two syllables, right? An unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Now, what Pound is arguing is that if you're thinking of your poetry this way, if, right, if this is how you're composing, you're not so much thinking about how things flow together sonically, you're thinking about how they, um, <clears throat> like how they accord with a relatively kind of arbitrary beat, right? So you, you're trying to make everything fit this kind of dut dut. If you're writing in iams, you're trying to make everything fit this kind of dut 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 rhythm, rather than kind of like, like if you actually if you know if you listen to music, it usually doesn't flow that way, right? So yeah, he is arguing for a less artificial way of composing a line. Now the other thing that is important here is his use of the words subjective and objective, because this is something that creeps into Yeats's thinking in this period. And this is kind of where we're going to finish up, because I think this is going to influence uh, where you're going with the, your presentation on Yeats's most batshit, whack-ass poetry. Um, so, subjective means kind of inward and self-focused. Right. Objective is outward and other-focused. So romantic poetry, for example, tends to be subjective, right? Most romantic poems, right, they're not really about nature, they're actually about thinking. Whereas Victorian poetry, um, with its, you know, uh, tendencies towards realism and social concerns, tends to be objective. So Yeats takes this in a bizarre direction which is relevant to the Second Coming and also to Paramica Silentia Lune, right? So he's reading all of these, all, all of this European philosophy and not quite understanding it, but incorporating it into his work nonetheless. So he's reading a lot of Nietzsche, so a lot about, you know, supermen and, you know, like these kind of like transcendent, passionless beings that um, kind of like force history to accommodate them. And he's reading a lot of Carl Jung as well, and is influenced by Jung's idea of a collective unconscious, right? This kind of um, universal storehouse of images that all human beings share. Uh, when he talks about spiritus mundi, that's really what he means. He means something very similar to Jung's collective unconscious.
but he develops all of this into a completely nuts theory of history. So history for Yeats is symbolized by these two spinning cones that penetrate one another. He calls them gyres. One gyre is, represents objectivity. The other, subjectivity. And he usually leaves the objective cone white and colors in the subjective cone uh, black. And when the objective gyre is dominant, um, you have ages that are kind of, historical ages that are kind of conformist and collective. When the subjective cone is dominant, this is when you get these kind of, you know, heroic ages of superior beings doing great things. And at the beginning of each age, or the end of each age, depending on what you want to think of it, there's usually this, some kind of enormous rupture, right? So he regards, for example, the sack of Troy as one of these historical ruptures. He uh, regards the birth of Christ as another one of these historical ruptures. Right, the birth of Christ he saw as ushering in the objective age in which we currently live, which he believed was about to be replaced by a new heroic subjective age. And that this all sounds like completely bizarre and completely nuts and something like no one other than Yates would ever believe, um, yeah, that's pretty much correct, right? <clears throat> What's that? Well, you know, I don't want to say he was a loony. He believed some strange things. I don't want to go so far as to say that he was, that he was himself mentally ill. Um, a lot of this was the result of a kind of a fairly typical modernist project of a kind of search for alternative spiritualities. Right? As people, more and more people felt like you know, conventional Episcopalianism or Catholicism or whatever wasn't really filling the bill for them. They, they, they were, you know, either influenced by Eastern religion or by, you know, the tradition of Western occultism. Yeats happens to be influenced by both. And one of the things he's doing here is kind of fusing some of these ideas. So he's fusing Hindu ideas about cyclical history with ideas from Western occultism. That's where his ideas get a little... Yeah, that. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, yeah. That's where he goes that way. Yeah, I, I, I did once when I was in graduate school, um, I had to sit through a presentation by another student um, who didn't seem to grasp that no one but Yates ever believed this, and that this wasn't a system that, like, he presents this as a system that he got from a book by a character he calls Michael Robartes, right? So Michael Robartes is just one of Yeats' own alter egos. You know, there is no such person as Michael Robartes, but this other student did not seem to realize that, like, no, there is no Michael Robartes. Michael Robartes is Yeats. And I just kind of remember sitting there in, in frustration. She continued this presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Poor child. Yeah. No, because you do your research first. <laughs> okay, so we're about out of time with this, and I think that, um, you know, one, it's midterm and everybody's tired, and two, I get that Gates really kind of does everybody's head in. So, let me give you the last questions for next time. I think you will find Catherine Mansfield a little less difficult than Yates. Uh, quiz you week? will not have a vocab quiz this week. Because we only we only met uh, 
for instruction the once, um, and also you, you need a little break. That was also why I didn't give you a quiz on this today. I have a silly question that I 